currently Kirkland. Your source for city news and events in the community. With Erica Sanford at the news desk, stay up to date with weekly news reports on what's happening in Kirkland. Now, here's Erica. Welcome to Currently Kirkland, where every week you can engage with your community by discovering the latest developments in citywide events. I'm Erica Sanford. The Lake Street Timekeeper stopped fulfilling its duty one year ago. We know this because Vince Isaacson, owner of Lake Street Diamond Company, has been staring at the clock ever since he started the jewelry store 27 years ago. He used the clock to reset customers' watches and, of course, to answer a common customer question. It did keep really good time, he said. But at 1.33, we're not sure whether that's a.m. or p.m., on November 17th of last year, the clock stopped. And for less quantifiable reasons, charm perhaps, circumstance has allowed the 76-year-old clock to stand still, when progress has forced the community around it to endure a year's worth of change. That, too, ended three weeks ago, when city crews brought the old clock down. And some have noticed. There was a clock there before, huh? Yeah. And now it's gone? It's gone. Oh, why do you think it's gone? I have no idea. I mean, it was here in Kirkland forever, and it's gone. Well, I understood that was a donation by the uh, captain of the ferry that uh, used to be back here in the day, and uh, as a thank you to the city. The disappearance provoked one letter writer to ask, quote, is it being repaired, didn't exactly keep good time, or is it gone for good? It would be sad if it's the latter. I thought it was very charming." Unquote. The answer to the question is not simple. No one knows. Last month, the city's maintenance workers removed the clock for inspection at the request of a citizen. And when they opened it up to inspect the electronic timekeeping mechanism, they discovered the effect time can have on a clock. Rust had consumed so much of the clock, the city's signal technicians were afraid to fix it, out of concern they'd end up damaging it even more. The maintenance team then contacted a Spokane-based horologist who used photos to diagnose the clock. The good news is that the clock's crucial electronic component is still manufactured today. The bad news? is the clock will likely require professional restoration that could cost the city more than it is willing to spend. The city's maintenance team is waiting on a service quote from the sign company. Until then, the clock will remain in the city's maintenance warehouse. Seven of Kirkland's elementary schools are now safer to walk to, thanks to the completion of a state grant and a local capital improvement project. New sidewalks now exist along school walk routes for Rose Hill. And they walk probably a quarter of the time. Yeah, they're great, yeah. A um, lot, lot nicer for uh, especially the kids and stuff like that. Lakeview and Ben Franklin Elementary Schools. It's a lot nicer than walking on the street. Veronica's in fourth grade and she knows that most of the kids walk over here to Ben Franklin Elementary. So yeah, I think we're psyched about it. We love it. I mean, you put some new sidewalks in the street and it's really wonderful. So we'd love to see just this last little bit for us. And, uh, but no, we like where you're going. They finished sidewalks to Peter Kirk, Juanita, A.G. Bell, and Mark Twain earlier in the summer. The City of Kirkland and the State of Washington collaborated on a second sidewalk route to Peter Kirk Elementary School that passes through a wetland and stream buffer zone. To mitigate those impacts, however, city engineers designed a path that uses 50 feet of boardwalk to span the stream and 380 feet of pervious sidewalk to maintain the free flow of water to the wetlands. Well, we used a couple of unique items here, one of them being the boardwalk you see behind me here. Um, that's not a normal structure that we built here in the city of Kirkland, although we are using them more in critical areas. Um, there's been a lot of new ones put into the new Juanita Bay Park recently. Uh, another item that we're using as part of our low impact development is the pervious sidewalk that we're standing on here. That is intended to be an open structure that allows rainwater to percolate through and 
reinfiltrate back into the ground. So we also included a couple other elements in this project, one of them being the grass line drainage swale here. We need somewhere for uh, water that doesn't immediately go into the ground, either from the road or from the sidewalk, to go to to find its way into our drainage system. Uh, the other thing you'll notice next to this is we also added a bit of a pervious pavement edge to the roadway here because the roadway width was substandard to begin with. We were under a constraint that we could not put any new impervious, so non free through flowing uh, materials into this area. So we came up with the idea of using the pervious pavement also as a road pavement. So it's kind of a test that we're trying. Um, it provides the extra width and gets us to a road that meets the city standards. On top of all this, city crews removed invasive Himalayan blackberry, evergreen holly, and other non-native species from a 5,000 square foot area of the wetlands. In place of the blackberry and holly, workers planted native species such as western red cedar, Douglas fir, common snowberry, and big leaf maple trees. Part of the mitigation for impacting the existing wetland here, um, we used the pervious sidewalks and whatnot, but we also did some improvements of the existing landscaping here. So I had a crew come in, remove the existing invasive vegetation that was here last summer, and then at the end of the project here, we had a wetland biologist come out and provide us design uh, and plantings here that will over time grow in, keep the invasives from reinvading the area here and provide a much higher quality um, environment here and enhance the existing wetland. So we're providing a bump to bring the function of the wetland up to a higher level. The point of the project, of course, was to better protect children on their journeys to school. To do that, however, McDonald had to find a way of protecting the environment as well. It's definitely improved the function of the wetland around here and has also improved the traffic characteristics by opening up the sight lines here and provided a safe walking route for both the neighborhood users and uh, children that are going to and from the school here. In addition to the completion of the state-funded projects, the much-needed pedestrian path along 60th Street to Ben Franklin Elementary is also complete. That project began with plans by the Central Park Tennis Club to build four more indoor tennis courts, a parking area, and a viewing area. Increasing the club's eight indoor courts to 12 will make the Central Park Tennis Club one of the nation's biggest member-owned indoor tennis facilities. But the expansion also juxtaposes the tennis club's entrance with the entrance to Ben Franklin, creating the potential for morning and afternoon traffic jams. To mitigate the congestion that could have resulted, the tennis club scheduled its court times to complement Ben Franklin's student drop-off and pickup times. The tennis club also built the path along 60th Street's north side to accommodate the many students who walk to school. Initially, the path was going to be a concrete sidewalk with a gutter and curb. This is what the Ben Franklin Parent Teachers Association wanted. And curbs, gutters, and sidewalks are the standard form of impact mitigation developers use when pursuing ambitious improvements to properties. The local equestrian groups, however, were concerned horses would slip on the concrete. Eventually, over the course of a single meeting, the equestrian groups and the Parent Teachers Association agreed on a polymer-based gravel pathway that is springy and has traction for horses. The City of Kirkland and Hopelink are encouraging citizens to make the holidays more comfortable for low-income families by joining the annual Turkey Trot a three-mile fun run and walk. A link to online registration is available now at hopelink.org, and on-site registration opens at 10 a.m. on November 20th. The fun run begins at 11 a.m., and the walk starts five minutes later. Strollers and pets are both welcome and free. The route takes participants from Marina Park in downtown Kirkland to Carillon Point and back again. For the ambitious, however, the journey begins with door-to-door -door campaigns seeking pledges. Last year, 446 Puget Sounders registered for the turkey trot and raised more than $111,000 for low-income families. With the addition of a fun run, however, 
organizers believe those numbers could be higher. Remember, you can access any episode of Currently Kirkland on demand on the city's website, on your mobile devices, and on YouTube. We'd also love to hear from you. If you have any news tips, suggestions, or comments, please send them to kirklandtv at kirklandwa.gov. Thanks for watching Currently Kirkland. We'll see you next week.